some key points. Um, one of them, the first, which I've already mentioned, is that superbugs is a very broad topic that includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites that are resistant to the treatments we normally use. And the question is, how did we get to this point that we have these pathogens, these microbes, that have become resistant to treatments? And I'll say before I go a step further is to say that a lot of doctors don't like the term superbugs. In fact, a month after my book came out, I got an email from a professor at the Cleveland Clinic who said, you know, Dr. McCarthy, you really shouldn't call it superbugs. You should call it difficult to treat infections. I said, well, it's not much of a book title. And the more I thought about it, I said, you know, the tricky thing about superbugs is that they're not always difficult to treat. And when I was talking, emailing with this guy, what I said was, I would just come from the emergency room where I saw a man with an E. coli superbug infection that was resistant to eight different antibiotics. But that E. coli was susceptible to Leviquin, a pill that I just gave him and sent him home. It turned out it was actually relatively easy to treat. So just because a bacterium or a microbe is resistant to an antibiotic doesn't mean you have no treatment options. It just means that they can be a challenge sometimes to treat. And so I want to give you a little perspective on how we got here. And that will inform us in terms of where we're going. So many people are familiar with the first commercially available antibiotic, something called penicillin. Probably learned about it in school a long time ago, but I'll hit the highlights, which are that in the late 1920s, a guy named Alexander Fleming was fumbling around in his laboratory, just up from Paddington Station in London, and he noticed something interesting, which is that he had a Petri dish that was normally covered with bacteria, and he found that there was a big chunk on that Petri dish where the bacteria had all died, and it had died around the presence of a fungus. And he put two and two together and said, I think this fungus is making a chemical, secreting a chemical that kills the staph, that kills bacteria. And he said, I think this is a big deal. This chemical might be able to kill off other bacteria. But he didn't realize how important what he had discovered. And in fact, he let the idea fade away. And it wasn't until the early 1940s, the investigators at Oxford University revisited his initial discovery and started doing more research. And they figured out that he had stumbled upon a fungus that produced this chemical called penicillin. And that became the first commercially available antibiotic, which by the end of World War II, we were widely distributing to soldiers and then to people all over the world. Following that came a second antibiotic, something that we now call the sulfa drugs, sulfonilamide. It was created by a German scientist who was doing his experiments as in the 1930s in Nazi Germany. Uh, his name was Gerhard Domach. I tell the story of, of Domach because he wasn't a Nazi. He was one of the few who refused to return the Hitler salute, the Hail Hitler salute. And when he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the sulfa drug, Hitler threw him in jail. But those two discoveries, back to back, of penicillin and sulfa drugs, ushered in, in the 1950s, what we call the golden era of drug development. The 1950s was a period where every few months, a new antibiotic hit the market. Life expectancy blossomed. There was all of these new discoveries hitting the market, new antibiotics every three months. And it seemed like the possibilities were limitless. That story is actually one you may have heard in grade school. It's one that has been told to a lot of people. But what hasn't been taught is what happened after that golden era. And that's where a lot of the research for my book came. If there was so much optimism and so much wonderful discoveries, why are we in this situation with superbugs? Part of that begins in the 1960s, when a number of prominent scientists, including Nobel laureates, came out and said, you know, we got this infectious disease issue kicked. We should start focusing on other conditions like heart disease, like cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry, the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry at that time, took their cues from these scientists and said, OK, you think there's more we could be doing with heart disease and cancer and diabetes and eye disease? OK, 
And so they started aggressively making new drugs to help people with those conditions. And it turned out it was very profitable. And it wasn't until, and, and I can tell you how powerful that shift was. In the 1970s and 80s, there were no new classes of antibiotics created. We still had the, the marvelous ones that were discovered in the 50s, but we weren't looking ahead. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we began to appreciate the scope of this problem. In the 1990s, we started seeing superbugs. We started seeing bacteria that had been mutating all along, kind of under cover, behind our backs, while we weren't looking. And the way this happens is every time a human takes an antibiotic, let's say there's a trillion bacteria living in your body, in your colon. You take a Z-Pak for a sinus infection. 50% of those bacteria, let's say 80% of those bacteria will survive. But a small portion of them will mutate. And they'll mutate in a way to become resistant to that Z-Pak the next time you take it. And these bacteria are constantly evolving all the time so that the more antibiotics they see, they see, the more resistant they become. And so it was in the 1990s that we developed these very sophisticated diagnostic tests where we could say, whoa, that simple staph infection has become resistant to our antibiotic called methicillin. And methicillin-resistant staph is what we call MRSA. You probably have heard of MRSA before. It's one of the most famous superbugs. MRSA is methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, or simply a staph infection that's resistant to a particular antibiotic called methicillin.